Luke chapter 16 is where we're going to start today. Really, it's we're going to jump ahead to a passage of Scripture that we would have been covering as we go through the Gospel of Luke. So that's the idea. But we're jumping ahead to this passage of Scripture because it goes along with what I wanted to focus on this morning. Um, a few weeks back, there was a law that was passed in Canada that basically made it illegal for pastors to be able to teach the truth about biblical sexuality, what the Bible teaches about what sexuality is, and to call, um, you know, the past, I guess it was considered like an anti-bigotry law or anti-whatever you would call the word, you know, um, against homosexuals or transgenders or things along those lines. Um, but in doing so, that silences or attempts to silence those who preach the clear teaching of Scripture, which is what we're going to do this morning. And so John MacArthur, who is a wonderful man of God whom I respected a lot, especially in the past couple of years, because he refused to shut down whenever they were allowing liquor stores and strip clubs and things like that to remain open as uh, essential services, but when churches were shut down as not essential services during COVID times and things like that, he always stood strong that, no, we as followers of Jesus Christ must gather to worship Him. Because God is sovereign whether you want to believe it or not, whether you want to acknowledge it or not. He is sovereign and He has commanded us to worship Him, and we're going to continue to do that. And so with this law against... Um, preaching the clear truth of the scriptures that's in Canada, John MacArthur has asked that churches would stand this particular Sunday morning in solidarity and unity with those brothers um, in Canada who are now going against the dictates of man's law in order to be faithful to God's law. And I thought we would join with them. So that's the idea this morning. We are joining together with them in solidarity to clearly articulate what the scriptures have to say about human sexuality, about marriage, even about divorce because it's related to our passage and it's related to what God has designed. And we're going to do that this morning. Um, so take, turn with me to Luke chapter 16. We're looking only in verse 18 at Luke's portion of this. And then we're going to take and we're going to look at what's called a harmonization uh, the parallel passage that Matthew gives us of what Jesus is going to say. So let's read this scripture and then turn to um, Matthew chapter um, 19. So it says this in Luke chapter 16, verse 18. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Now in this passage of scripture... Jesus is in the midst of teaching various things. And this Luke just includes this as a little snippet of his teaching as he goes along his way. Jesus has made his turn, his focus toward Jerusalem, as we have been talking about. He's still making that turn and going that way in Luke chapter 16 when we get to this passage. But I wanted to show that Luke continues to teach about this in the same way that Matthew does. It's just that Matthew does it in a little bit different way. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 19. We're just going to be looking at the first five verses or so from Matthew chapter 19. And we're going to look at this same passage that Jesus is speaking, because I wanted to continue in Luke, but we're looking at it from the perspective of how Matthew gives it to us, and it comes in the way of an answer of a question. So looking in verse 1, uh, Matthew is giving it to us. It says in verse 1, chapter 19, says, Now when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And a Pharisee came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? So there's the question that brings Jesus' estate. You understand that? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them, 
uh, from the beginning made them male and female. And said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they that are no longer two but one flesh. They are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And they said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? And he said to them, Because your hardness of heart, uh, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, Whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. You see how that's the expanded portion of what Jesus mentioned in Luke chapter 16, verse 18. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, it is our prayer that your words be made clearly manifest today. That you would give me the words to speak concerning the truth of your word and the truth of this passage of Scripture. Open our eyes and our ears and our minds and our hearts to receive your word this morning. And you are finished with my speaking, Lord. Shut my mouth. We pray these things in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Biblical sexuality. That's all I'm calling today's message, just biblical sexuality. Um, there are two schools of thought that I remember in seminary that are also true amongst what people do whenever they uh, investigate counterfeit coins. <laughs> and they're, they're one and the same in the sense that there are two ways that we think about it. So the first way is to think of all the things that are marking a coin that's counterfeit or to mark a teaching of scripture that's counterfeit. So read people like Boltmann or the, the Göttingen School and the, or the liberal theologians and Read the atheist literature. Read what they're saying so you understand what they're saying in order to understand what is not truthful versus what is truthful. In other words, in the same way with a counterfeit coin or dollar or something like that, look at all the ways that people have counterfeited it and look for those aberrations and then you know that what you're looking at is something that's counterfeit. The other school of thought is instead of thinking of all the different ways that something is wrong, be really, really sure about what's right. So understand what uh, a, a real coin or real dollar bill or, or something like that. Or, or really understand the truth of what the scriptures have to say. And be so familiar with what the truth is or so familiar with what the correct thing is that you can easily spot something that is an aberration from that. What we're going to see this morning is the Pharisees who do what theologians like to do. They like to sit around and they want to argue about this versus this and have questions about this versus this. They're having a discussion, it seems, or at least they're wanting to know what Jesus thinks about their little theological discussion. At this point in time, there were two competing rabbis that had schools of thought regarding marriage and divorce. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1, I believe, or the first few chapters of Deuteronomy 24, I believe that's where it is, is the, is the passage where Moses, through God, gives a, a certificate of divorce, an allowance of when it says that whenever deceitfulness is found in your wife, you may write her a certificate of divorce. And so this school of thought was this. What does that mean? You know, if there was deceitfulness or there was something impure or something found in your wife, you were allowed to give a certificate of divorce. What does that impure thing mean? One school of thought, the Shammai school of thought said, well, that means porneia, immorality. If you find sexual immorality in your wife, okay, in other words, if your wife has committed adultery on you, then you are allowed to write her a certificate of divorce. And so that's, that's what that word means. And there was another school of thought that, that cheapened marriage so much to say that, no, 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 there was the Hillel school that said that if you find anything wrong, if you get any disagreement with your wife, if your wife doesn't do a good job cleaning the house or making dinner or something along those lines, you can just divorce your wife for anything, any fault that you find with her. And so that's 
the discussion that's being had between these two schools of thought. And so they come to Jesus to ask him, well, what do you think, Jesus? And that's why it says, and the Pharisees came up to him and tested him. They wanted to know where he was in their argument. And they said, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And so that's, that's the question. It's the for any cause. We know that there is a, a, a divorce option that's given according to the law of Moses, Jesus. We know that, that Moses allows it. It's just when... Is divorce allowed? For any reason at all, or, or what? You give us. You give us the answer, Jesus. So there's a couple things that I want us to take from this passage of Scripture as we continue on. Number one is this. Jesus is going to, just like, just like the counterfeit coin, just like the teaching, he's going to go back to the blueprints. You understand you will understand all aberrations to this, all things that are wrong about gender or divorce or marriage or things like this, by understanding what God's intention is, by understanding what God clearly defines as marriage, what God clearly defines as gender. Therefore, knowing the truth about what God says, it makes it very easy to understand what isn't what God has given. You understand what I'm saying? That's my point and what I was saying before. The second thing I want us to remember is this. There is a lot of people who will argue that Jesus never talked about homosexuality or gender or homosexual marriage or things like that. And so when we Christians say things about what God says marriage is, or what God says gender is, or things along those lines. We're not quoting Jesus. We're just quoting Moses, who said it in Leviticus 19. Or we're quoting Paul, who said so in Romans that we read this morning, or 1 Corinthians chapter 6, or something like that. And they say, well, that's Paul, or that's Moses. Jesus never said anything about that. There's a Greek word for that. It's called baloney, right? Jesus, <laughs> of course has something to say about this. And this very passage is where he says it. Jesus did speak about homosexual marriage. He did speak about gender because what he does is he instead takes them with their question, they're having their little argument, and he is now going to take them to the intention of what God says, this is what marriage is, and this is who's involved in marriage. And so Jesus does speak about homosexual marriage because he's saying this is what marriage is. You understand what I'm saying? Also consider the audience in which Jesus is speaking. He's speaking to an audience that already understands that homosexual marriage is not given in the scriptures. He's given to an audience that already has given the law of Moses and they already do understand a man is a man, a woman is a woman, and only one man and one woman should get married. Period. But, in order to understand and clarify his position about marriage and divorce, he's going to take them to the beginning. So, let's look at what he says. <clears throat> and he answered them, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? This is elementary stuff, people. This is not rocket science. The problem is, the problem is, is that we don't want to listen to God. It's not a problem with what God has said. He's made it clear. He has defined things for us. He, in the beginning, God, day six, made them male and female. So let's first talk about gender this morning. Proper biblical understanding of what gender is. Jesus gives it to us right here. He says, from the beginning, he made them male and female. This is very, very much in the very first chapter. Okay, this is, this is right there in Genesis chapter 1. It's day 6, right around verse 26, verse 27, something like that. God says he made them in his image. Male and female, he created them. Okay? God first made a man by getting down into the dirt. 
He fashioned the man from the dirt, which is totally different from the way he created everything else. By the way. It's a picture of the image we have that we bear of God. It's a picture of the relationship that we have with God. How God loves His creation that were created in His image. He didn't just speak us into existence like He spoke everything else into existence. It's a picture of, of, of the familiarity of God with us. He got down in the dirt. He formed us. He formed a man and He fashioned him. And He breathed the breath of life in him. Then He said, it's not good for man to be alone. So I will create a helper for him. A helpmate. A partner. Someone to come alongside him. And so he took from the man a rib and he fashioned that into a woman. And then he united them together. So we'll get to that in a second. But first, I want us to understand that God created us male and female. If you are here this morning and you are a man or a boy and God, God, God created you that way and it's good that you are a man or you are a boy. Our culture hates masculinity. Our culture wants to redefine masculinity. It wants to say that men are evil and men are toxic. And masculinity is evil and toxic. It is not. God created men. The way He created men is good. Masculinity is good. It is right. It is how God created men to be. If you are here and you are a woman or you're a girl, it is good that God created you as a woman or a girl. You have been created that way to bear the image and the glory of God in the way that He created you that way. And it is good that He did so. And it is not wrong for you to be a woman. You are also not weak. You are not to be stepped on. You're not to be plowed over. You're not to be handed around. It is good if you were a man and God created you to be a man. And it is good if you were a woman because God created you to be a woman. And that's all there is to it. And so God created them male and He created them female. This is not only um, something that God has clearly defined in Scripture. This is something that God has clearly defined in nature. If you notice our passage of Scripture this morning that we read, Psalm 19, and Romans 1, both of them appeal not only to the law of God, which is clearly given to us, but they both also appealed to nature. Why? Why? Because God's given us two books. He's given us a general book, the general book of His revelation. And then He's given us a specific book, the specific book of the Scriptures. And in both of those cases, he has identified both by the way nature works and also by what He has clearly established in His Scriptures that God created things, people, male and female. One man and one woman create a baby. You literally can't do anything to change that. You can't change that. Sure, we like to do medical things to try to, you know, reinvent things and manipulate things and all the stuff like that. But it doesn't change the fact that it takes male DNA, female DNA, to come together and make a new creation. Because God worked it not only into how He uh, defined things in the Scriptures, but He worked it into how He orchestrated all of His creation. So whenever you deny that God created them male and God created them female, you are denying His creation and you are denying His revealed Word. It's doubly foolish to do so. It's doubly foolish to do so. Even an atheist can understand that if you only try to make males together or only try to make females together, you're going to kill a species. Because it just doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work. And so we see from creation, from nature, that God has made it this way. Jesus says, have you not understood, or have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? 
See, I think the problem uh, besides the culture, see, the culture, they, they, they want to become God, you see. It's the very same sin that was the very first sin that entered into creation. They don't want to listen to how God has taken things and orchestrated things. They would like to supplant God, make them God, on the, themselves God on the throne, and they can then define who they are instead of God defining who they are. I mean, we see this all the time. You can be anything you want to be. You don't like your gender? Just change it because you can do whatever you want to do. But that's not what God says. That's not what's been given to us revealed in His Word. He made them male and female. Not only has He made them male and female, He's given certain roles and identities that go along with being a man or with being a woman. Men are more suited to be protectors. They're more suited to be the ones who go out, tackle the world, to conquer things. Men have also been created to provide. And so a man who works hard to provide for his family and leads in his household is a man who is strong and happy and a household that is good. Women have become, have, are more nurturing. Um, they demonstrate their emotions in a different way than men. Men are very emotional as well. We're just emotional in different ways that women are emotional. But women have become, they're more nurturing. They're more Caregiving. They've been called to be more domestic and things along those lines. Both of these roles are good. They're also clearly defined in Scripture. To deny those things is to go against God's law. The sad part is, is that the church has done a pretty good job of making a mockery of genders and gender roles before the world ever got involved. We see all the time in the church how men are diminishing in their roles of leadership and taking charge in churches and leading the way and standing strong. And we see women taking those roles, usurping those roles from men in a lot of ways in churches. Why is it that so many churches are so built more on emotionalism, so built more on, on, on uh, uh, women leading these roles in all these different areas and men hate going to church in most cases? in most evangelical churches across the nation. It's because men have failed to step up to their role in many instances within the church of God. And women have then taken over where the men have fallen short. And it's a sad state. It's a bad place for the church to be in. Men in here, I challenge you to be men. Don't let the culture dictate to you the things that the culture is going to dictate, which are how not to be men. Your masculinity is good, but when you use it for evil things, then it becomes bad. But when you do things like, it, if you're not protecting your family, then who is, right? If you're not standing up and being a leader in your household, then who is? It's good for you. It's good that you do that. It's good that God created you as a man to be a man in your household, to stand strongly on what the Scriptures teach us on how to be men who lead our households well and lead in the church. Women, don't usurp the role of your men. Don't usurp the role that has been clearly given to your husbands to take leadership in your household. And that does not make you a doormat, even though that that's what the world will teach you. The greatest men in the world were all birthed by women. Motherhood and wifehood is such a good, good thing. And God created it for the glory of Himself and for the sake of, 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 of the household. If we didn't have men and women taking their roles in the household, then a household is a very bad place. So I'm challenging us as a church to... A, clearly define that God created men to be men, created women to be women, and it's good that men are men, and it's good that women are women. And so we do need to clearly say to the culture, what you're doing is wrong. Transgenderism is wrong. It's evil. It's sinful. And people need to repent of that. But I also want to challenge us in the church to not just look at the people out there who are doing these horrible 
horribly atrocious things that go against nature and nature's God. But also to look at ourselves and say, am I fulfilling the gender role that God has called me to fulfill in the church and in my household? Men, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Women, submit to your own husbands. That's the role for men and women in marriage and in the family. Continues on in verse 5, and he said, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. So, on top of the fact that Jesus clearly identifies male and female as genders, and the roles that go along with those genders, he doesn't spell it out here, but that's the idea. But he, he also then goes on to define what marriage actually is. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. One man, one woman, and then it says this, so that they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Now this is all talking about divorce in the context here. But first Jesus goes on to define, okay, before we talk about the exception, let's talk about the rule. The rule is one man, one woman for life. One man, one woman for life. Because he says, father, wife, or excuse me, excuse me, man, wife, and then it says, let not man separate, you see. So this is, I used to be really libertarian in my viewpoint on things. I used to be a very politically libertarian person. I still am a very liberty-minded person, but I have become much more conservative as I have grown up and the more I've understood things. And uh, partially this is thanks to uh, people like Doug Wilson <laughs> and people who have had those influences on my life because I used to be like, ah, the government has no business being in marriage and things like that. It's not the government's business to, def you know, to be in the marriage business at all. It's like two people can come together and blah, 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 blah. And then I realized, no, no. <laughs> Actually, that's not right. Marriage is not a contract. Marriage is a couple. And when God defines a covenant, it's not just some man-made contract. Hey, you and me, you want to get together and we get married? Okay, cool, that's great. Let's put together this contract. And when we're kind of sick of each other and done, we'll just break this contract and move about our business. No, that's not what marriage is. Marriage is a covenant of, a, of God putting together one man and one woman for life. And that's the intention. That's the intention. It says, let not man separate. So based upon this, obviously, anything else that we look at that's not defined as one man, one woman, for life, is an aberration. It is not biblical, therefore sinful. So two men cannot become put together in marriage. Two women cannot be put together in marriage. One man and several women cannot be put together in marriage. If you look at every time somebody went outside of God's law, even though it was sort of a cultural thing, Abraham, you know, uh, David, Solomon, the, uh, Jacob, who had multiple wives, you know, went against God's law and did it their own way, what happened? Every single time, families fell apart. David's son, Absalom, re led a rebellion against him because of that. Why? Because the family was not intended to be a man and multiple women. Polygamy is against God's law because it's not the definition. One man, one woman for life. This means it doesn't become, this, this, is, this is the difference between what the world talks about Christianity and what actual Christianity is. You know, that, that men just can sow their wild oats and be real promiscuous and get lots of wives and, you know, women should just submit to their husbands and men should be able to just do whatever they want to like that. No! God's got rules for this, too! Men are supposed to love their wives. They're one 
wife and treat them with honor and respect. And women should submit to their husbands, yes, but because they have a husband that also has fulfilled the role that he has fulfilled. It's both. It's both. And any aberration of that, any departure from that, is sinful and wrong. It's not two men, three women, three, you know, goats and two whatever. It doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter. You cannot change the definition of what God has put together. And so therefore, Jesus clearly identifies genders, and he clearly identifies marriage. So this is biblical sexuality. Biblical sexuality. I also want to make mention of the fact that this doesn't even account for the fact that anything, any other sexual practice outside of this definition, God has elsewhere defined very clearly as being sinful and wrong. So in other words, if you are not married yet, you should not be participating in any sexual activity. God has condemned that. It's called fornication. Whether we like to call it hooking up or shacking up or, or whatever you want to call it, God calls it sinful and wrong. And this is, once again, another one of those applications where we don't need to talk about how the world has messed up God's image for marriage. The church has been pretty bad about that. The church has been pretty bad about that. And the church needs to repent of it. Now, I hope you understand that in all of this, in no way, shape, or form, at all, am I saying that we're supposed to hate, ridicule, and condemn anybody who does not follow this. Okay? You understand what I'm saying? We have not been called to... Um, uh, call a woman like a girl who's become pregnant before she's married a prostitute or a slut or something like that. There's no place in God's church to be using that kind of language and condemning people in that way. Okay, So please understand that. Please understand that. We shouldn't be going off and, 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 and ripping homosexuals apart. We have to say the truth. We have to say you need to repent. We have to not, uh, 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 I, you know, the whole Westboro Baptist holding signs up and protesting funerals and stuff like that. God has not called us to be hateful, okay? God has not called us to be hateful. Um, he has called us to be honest and preach the truth, and we should do that. But He has not called us to be hateful, okay? So a woman, a girl, uh, we, we don't need to be calling girls whores or sluts or something like that. Also, I think it is sad that our culture has um, sort of called men, you know, players or, or, or um, you know, it's manly for a guy to sleep around and it's shameful for a girl. Uh, God's Word has something to say about that and it's just as evil for men to be participating in sexual activity outside of marriage as it is for women. So please understand that the scripture is very, very clear. Fornication is wrong, and God hates it. The other one that's mentioned in this particular passage, but also elsewhere, speaks on the idea of adultery. Okay, That is, having sexual relations with somebody who is not your spouse. Okay, So, so in a way, fornication is adultery, because, but it could be that they become your spouse, but, you know, but, but any sort of sexual activity that's not your spouse. And so, this, just by giving the definition of what is, we can automatically speak against everything else. So whether it's two men, two women, a man and a woman, any sort of sexual activity outside of marriage is sinful and wrong. And only sexual activity that is permissible is that which is defined by God within marriage. Right? Very clear stuff. Straight from Jesus' teaching. 
So let's continue on. Verse 7. So they said to them, why did Moses give a certificate of a divorce and send, uh, send her away? But he said to them, because your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. I won't rehash that. I already talked about that. But verse 9 says, and I say this to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. The last thing I want to mention this morning when we talk about biblical sexuality is how much God hates divorce. How much God hates divorce. And I'm not coming down on any person in here who is, if you've experienced divorce in your life, this is not a condemning thing, but it's, a, it's meant to articulate that God is very concerned about marriage. And I think that long before homosexual marriage became a sting and a plague within our nation, we were really, really bad about cheapening marriage to the point of allowing things like no-fault divorce to enter this nation. No fault divorce and the sexual revolution all preceded the current insanity of sexual uh, uh, um, immorality that happens now. But I think it's sad that we, even as a church, we even as Christians, have taken such uh, um, such a permissible stance on divorces instead of people fighting for marriages. Instead of reminding ourselves that God covenanted to put you together in marriage. And that when we break that, we break something that God has, has put into society. There was a, a friend of mine whose name is Matt. He's up in um, St. Louis. He's married to a Romanian wife. Um, Romanian fell you know, into communism or sort of taken over by communism you know, back 50 years ago, whatever, 40 years ago. And, uh, but, but whenever the USSR was going through and communizing sort of places, they had a hard time in Romania. And the reason why they had such a hard time in Romania is because there was a strong family unit. Um, communism doesn't work <laughs> in areas where families are strong because they don't need the government because the family's supposed to take care of each other and the family's supposed to provide and raise the kids. So there's no need for communism. There's no need for a state to hand you money or bread or to raise your children when you were raising your children and doing these things. Well, they started infiltrating. Um, they started bringing prostitutes into Romania. They started bringing pornography into Romania. And because of this, marriages started breaking up. And as long as they were able to start breaking the marriages up, as long as they were to start destroying families and breaking these units up and divorces were happening and now we have kids without fathers, kids without mothers, kids without parents, then communism was able to get the foothold because the state was able to come in and usurp and supplant the role of families in that nation. And we see it happening here. The reason why socialism has such a foothold here is because families are falling there's a reason why God hates divorce. And it does do amazing emotional damage. I'm product, my parents were divorced whenever I was four years old. And I still have moments of difficulty that come from it, things that show up from my past. But it's more than that. The entire society um, just Investors and it just gets really bad whenever you have single parent households or no parent households, kids being raised by schools instead of their families, kids being raised by grandparents instead of parents. And there's nothing wrong when you have to set up situations like if a grandparent has to come in and take over. Once again, this is not meant to be condemning in any way. I'm just saying this when you don't follow God's design, things fall apart. Things fall apart. So God created biblical sexuality for more than just um, it just has to be this way and I'm coming down or something like that. Is is no, it's for our own good. It's for the good of society. It's for the good of everything. It's for the good of raising children. It's for the good of strong marriages and good households. I mean, if you think about the the drug rate 
drug use rate and the suicide rate among homosexual people, among transgender people, among divorced people. I mean, it is astronomically high. Why? Because it's so painful and it's so hurtful. Because people are living something that is not what God intended. And you can't do stuff like that and not take its toll. So my appeal this morning is to not only stand strongly in what God's Word says about what is biblical sexual morality, but also to take it to a heart in our own lives. That we as the church would stay devoted and faithful to our spouses. To raise our children to be strong, godly men and women who will marry their spouses someday and raise children for themselves. To do our part to fulfill the role that God has created us. If you are a man in here, you have been called to step up and lead your family. If you are a woman in here, you have been called to submit to your husband and to raise children. Men raise children too. You know what I'm trying to say though. Fulfilling the roles that God has given you to fulfill. And that if there's anything in here that would cause that we are participating in that is not what God has designed. If men in here are looking at pornography, if there are women in here who are wrapped up in romance novels or emotional you know, affairs at work or something along those lines, man, you repent of that now. You repent and you turn away. God gave us these things. In the end, the whole picture that we have of the relationship that we have with God is one that's defined by God the Father as our husband and we are the bride of Christ. God used the marriage to talk about how he relates to his people. So any, any aberration of that, any redefining of that, it messes everything up. So let's be faithful to God. Let's be faithful to our wives, our husbands, to our children. And let's fulfill all that God has called us to fulfill. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for the truth of Your Word. How it teaches us the roles that are proper that You have given us, that You have defined for us. How to be men, how to be women, how to put marriages and families together for the sake of Your kingdom, for the sake of society and for the uh, testimony of, uh, of uh, the relationship that you have with us in Christ. The saving relationship. We thank you, Jesus, that you are the perfect picture of what a husband and a leader is. And I pray that every husband in here would look to Christ to know how we ought to love our wives, to raise our children. And that every woman in here would submit to their husbands as to the Lord in an understanding that if a husband is loving his wife as Christ loves the church, then a woman is able to happily submit to their husbands in that area. Help us to take your scriptures and let it define who we are and guide us in every aspect of our and if there is something that is against what you have clearly defined, help us to repent of it and be faithful and obedient to you. We pray all these things in your name, Lord Jesus.